Welcome, everybody, to the Weekly Grind, episode number four. I am your host, Keith Fabry, with my co-host tonight, Dr. Todd Lee, and our special guest, the owner of Trapona Nutrition and MuscleMentor.net, Justin Harris. Guys, how are we doing tonight? Great. What's up? Fantastic. All right. And we have Justin on here tonight, uh, Todd, so that we can talk about carb cycling since he is the godfather of carb cycling, uh, the one that pretty much made it famous and now everybody does it and it's because of Justin. So, Justin, welcome to the show. And uh, I'm going to let you talk a little bit about yourself. Uh, give us uh, a little info on your contest history and your some of the people you've worked with uh, in the past. Okay. Well, uh, let's see. <clears throat> Started competing in 2004. I did the I won the Capital City Classic, heavyweight and overall, then the 2004 Michigan, Mr. Michigan, heavyweight and overall. Uh, 2005, I went to the Junior Nationals, got my ass kicked, and came back and won, uh, won the he- Super Heavyweight at the 2006 Junior USAs. And then the 2007 USAs, I was, you got to remember, ninth or seventh in the Super Heavies. And I took a long hiatus and came back and uh, got my ass kicked at the Masters Nationals last year. Right. Todd, uh, didn't you, you work with uh, Luke Sando last year and turn him pro? Uh, yeah, yeah. I worked with him uh, when he turned pro and then for the Arnold Classic. Awesome. Last year, yeah. Right. And I mean, I've worked with, yeah, uh, you know, I've been doing this for 15 years. I, there's, there's not too many people I haven't worked with at one point or another. Right. The, the, you know, the thing is, it's the probably part of the bodybuilding mentality. Most guys jump around quite a bit. And even, and I almost even encourage that, you know, you, you, you click better with certain people and I haven't, and so I recommend kind of moving around and seeing who you fit with, but I worked, you know, Steve Kuklo, uh, oh geez, like it, there's quite a bit of pros, Zach Cobb, Sean Allen, uh, a lot of female pros, I can't remember everyone's name over the years, Right. it's over 15 years, there's quite a few people right. I've worked with off and on. Right, and you're uh, you're currently working with uh, one of the younger guys here in Michigan. That's an up and coming guy, and Dominic Trivellini. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, he's another. Well, he's got all the tools. Uh, another, I like working with the young guys because uh, it's fun to watch them develop. But then I, you know, I really try to spend some time discussing the life, how to how to become a, a the business of bodybuilding. Right, guess, you know, and I think that's something Steve. Was done really well. So many of these young guys, you know, they shut out the rest of the world and they don't they, they focus on bodybuilding and turning pro and then they don't think about how they're actually going to feed themselves once that happens. <laughs> yeah. Right, because they're not making the money that they were years and years ago and the guys the guys don't have the big contracts anymore like they used to with uh, the supplement Oh yeah, the, the years of winning the, the nationals and then stepping off stage with a six figure weeder contract are long gone. I mean, right. there's still there's more money in bodybuilding than there's ever been probably, but. You got to work for it now. You don't just you, know, you don't just get it for right. for winning a show. You know right. you got you got to you got to hustle and, and make the money now. Right. <laughs> well, uh, there was a uh, a time when you were uh, writing for Elite FTS and you did some work with T Nation, and that's where I kind of picked up on uh, who you were as a uh, as a nutritionist, as a prep coach, and listen, uh, reading some of your articles and stuff. Uh, talk to us about uh, some of the. About those days when you were uh, working with them, and you were a optimum nutrition athlete at one time as well. Yeah, kind of uh, at, at my peak involvement in the sport, I was uh, I was with Optimum Nutrition, uh, sponsored by them, and uh, salaried out with them. And then I, uh, I I had a monthly article of muscular development called uh, Power Bodybuilding. That's right. I forgot about that. Uh, yeah, uh, I wrote for Flex. I was an Ironman. I wrote for Muscle and Fitness. I think I did a thing for Oxygen Magazine and Men's Health, uh, T Nation pretty often, and then Elite FTS I, I wrote for, I, I kept a blog there, and I uh, wrote a number of articles and did videos with them, and uh, yeah, I think that's about it. You still had the Elite FTS one just a couple of years ago, too, because I think uh, yeah. I ended up in one yeah, of your yeah, one I'm of your still, blogs. I mean, I'm still technically an athlete with them. I'm still on the... the part of their athletes Facebook page and uh, right. they just did an article on prep coaches that I did with them yep. where you know we discussed so three things three reasons to hire a prep coach basically yep uh, and, I, and I'm, I'm friends with Dave the owner I still go I try to get down there it's, it's like a five and a half hour drive right. I try to get down there to train as much as possible uh, I just trained and actually we just trained and did video there at the Arnold last year uh, uh, with with 
quite a few people. Dave Green was down there filming. We, we filmed some video for Muscle Mentor. Uh, so I'm, I'm still technically an athlete. I just I, I just feel bad because every time I try to try to get a training log going up there, I, I, I'm just too busy and I start slacking on it. And I just feel that, you know I feel like a dickhead. It's not fair to Dave to have right. You know that would spend the time and effort on me when I'm not reciprocating it. So right, yeah, because I came down and trained with you a couple years ago uh, at uh, at your gym and you were still writing for them there because I ended up in that, uh, in that blog that for that day, oh, yeah, yeah, training back. Yeah. That's when you called me a pussy for not wanting to do deadlifts. So I did deadlifts anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you were strong. I remember that you were strong as hell for not doing deadlifts. I had been doing rack pulls cause my, lo- I had gotten that car wreck back in, uh, the end of oh, 2013 yeah, and my yeah. lower back yeah. was, I just, I just didn't trust it. You know, there's all these jacked up and I didn't trust doing it. And I said, ah, fuck it. If he's doing them, I'm going to do them too. And then since then I've been doing them now. So I've been doing them for the last, what, two and a half years. I've been doing deadlifts at least a couple of times a month. Yeah. And no, I, sometimes, sometimes you just gotta do stupid things that could hurt you. <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't believe I pulled as much off the floor as I did because I was like, "Fuck, I haven't done these in a while." And you and I remember doing them, and you uh, you just looked at me and you go, "Well, your form fucking sucks." But <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, no, I don't do them, so I don't do them that often anymore." I remember you were muscling up. I was pretty impressed. Yeah, because were you were you dieting then, or were you just getting off? I was getting ready for I was getting ready for junior nationals. I was uh, yeah, yeah. I couldn't have been more than eleven or twelve weeks out at that point. Because I was down around two fifteen, I think yep, two sixteen. Because yep. you looked at me afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh. So you're not doing as much with Elite FTS anymore. I know you're not doing anything really with T Nation. I do see some of those articles. They they pop up on Facebook every now and again. They they like somebody posts them off of T Nation. You see, it's a Justin Harris article or something. Um, and you have MuscleMentor.net. Talk to us about MuscleMentor.net because that is uh, your website. It's a subscription-based website. It does have some free stuff on it. Uh, yeah. And- yeah, well, probably too much free stuff. That's that's one of the problems. I'm, uh, you know, I like talking about this stuff, and I like doing it. I'm not, I'm, pro- I'm not as good of a businessman as I probably should be. There's, uh, there's, there's hours and hours of free footage. Actually, we have. Much more paid footage, but yeah, it's uh, it's ten ninety nine a month. Uh, you get unlimited access to all the member section, and there is, these I think, I think we're over two hundred videos in the in the member section now, uh, dozens of articles, but o- over two hundred videos. You know, some of them as long as a half an hour. So there's right. there's hours and hours and hours of footage, and it's it's basically, you know, one of my complaints is it's. The great thing about the internet is that it's opened all this information up. The bad thing is, is that anyone's allowed to, to spew it out, basically. Right. And so you really, it's hard to find, it's hard to find people who give, uh, who, who do more than just make a statement, who give, you know, give the science behind their, their the statements. And, right. And I'm, I'm sure Todd feels the same way, you know, having, having his, his, you know, a medicine background that it, it can be frustrating that you, you, you get an argument with someone on the internet and, uh, you know you're right because you're not you're not saying anything opinion. You're just stating a medical fact, and, right. and, and the people reading don't have any background in it, so they don't know who to believe. So they end up believing whoever was the one to, to type in all capitals first, basically. Right. So uh, that's so what Muscle Mentor basically was was I wanted what all the things I wasted years on not knowing, not doing correctly. If I could put that all on one website, so someone could log on, you know, they don't got they don't have you know, a thousand dollars or whatever to hire a prep coach or hire a coach, you log on there. And if you are willing to take the time and watch the videos and take notes, you'll get an education at that same level as hiring someone full time for just $10 a month. So yeah. that, that's kind of what it's designed for. Yeah. I went through the site and there is like, uh, you're, you're right. There's a lot of stuff on there for free that a lot of stuff that is just really, really valuable information. Just, I mean, just some of the, some of the the videos and stuff on there, you stop to talk about this and just the training stuff on there alone. I mean, people can see what what actual training intensity is and some of the things that you're doing and some of the some of the band work you've put on there and the different angles that you use with within training for somebody who's got a more advanced physique for it's been doing it for you know eight ten years, whereas opposed to somebody who's a, a beginner that should just be sticking with the the basics and stuff. But some of that stuff on there is really really valuable information and and, and yeah, it's it's a really good yeah, site. I mean, like I said, in the member section, we go full, full in depth. All the things people don't like to cover. I mean, we talk, right. you know, super supplements and and you know what people are doing, what what works, what doesn't. Right. So, uh, yeah. 
I'm proud of the site. Todd, you got any questions for Justin? Well, I kind of do the same thing. I do have actually, I wrote down some list of questions, but it's like on my site, I've got like, I think 400 articles and I think on my YouTube channel, I've got like 800 videos. There's a lot and of videos. Like, if you're not making them pay for it, they don't give a fuck. Yeah. And, so, yeah. and you got this field of these remedial one out of 10 education questions that are just like really going to bog down the attempts to find that diamond in the rough that's the one person you are getting through to that is willing to read the article to back up the video to make sense of it, that doesn't expect you to spoon feed them information because they're so entitled, that actually understands that anything worth earning, you have to earn. Like to get the information, you have to f actually sit and read the entire article or watch the entire video that they want it to be in three minutes when the subject itself is like a 30 minute subject minimum. So I actually was looking through the muscle mentor um, site the other day and I was like, wow, this leg workout looks a lot like my high volume leg workout. And it actually made me feel good. I was like, that means that like Justin Harris would approve of this leg workout. You know, when I went into the gym that day and I cut the volume down because I was going heavier, but that's like almost identical to what I would do. But my workout, that high volume leg workout you put up, that's like the two of my workouts. That's like a, a one and a half hour calves and hams. Then you eat, then you come back and you do leg um, quads and leg press and squats. And it's like, you did that all at once. And I've done that a couple times, but I've never like just had a traditional three hour leg workout all the way through like that. So it was pretty cool to see that on there. Um, and I know that you have a lot of cutting edge stuff. I remember we drove that hour and a half to see the seminar with you and John Meadows. And it was like, after a while in the conversation, it was you and me talking and everyone else was looking bored. So I, was, <laughs> I, don't know, I remember because I, <laughs> one of the questions, I, I pulled something out about protein synthesis or something. And I thought I caught everyone and, and you, you answered it right out of the blue. And I was like, God damn it, you're not supposed to know that. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, because John's there, but he doesn't think as fast as you do, I think, in that day. Maybe so whatever, maybe he drove a long time. But it was like, he was glossing over, and you were, like, hitting shit sharp. And I was like, oh, my God. It's like playing tennis with words. It actually doesn't talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, basically, what I always found confusing, and you could probably clear this up being the carb master, is the interrelationship between growth hormone, insulin, and IGF-1. For instance, a lot of people will, they say, don't use insulin without GH because you'll store fat. Makes sense. You can't use GH without insulin because you're desensitized to insulin by the GH. You need insulin. To me, injecting insulin would then just increase your insulin resistance over time. That the interplay of the IGF-1 sensitizes muscle tissue to insulin but doesn't cause insulin to get stored in fat cells. And I base, you know, I have like a series of questions based on this, but I basically want to give you a chance to discuss it and just a broader overview. So that, that might knock out four of my five questions right. right there. Yeah. I mean, I think my, my basic thoughts on it are, I think insulin has been really misused and misunderstood. Uh, it's just in general by the bodybuilding community. I think, I think everyone missed the mark in the beginning when the, the you know 15 20 years ago when it was guys were taking taking it post workout every every workout and that's all they right. did you know right. once a day one one quick shot post workout and then I think uh, recently it's evolved even more to to overuse where guys are using you know Humulin and Atlantis and taking it all day every day and uh, and and I think they're getting that from certain high level bodybuilder protocols where the truth is, is that the bodybuilders that are doing that are doing it because they're diabetic, they're insulin resistant now. And that's, ah. from, the, yeah, the, you know, and that's from the growth hormone. I mean, you got guys running 10 plus I use a growth hormone year round for years. Yeah. I mean, you, they're completely, they, I mean, they're full fledged diabetic. They're yep. running with, without insulin, they're running fasted blood sugar levels in the 200s. Right? right. So then of course you need insulin. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's the, that's the, unfortunate side side of bodybuilding that people don't like to talk about but you know at that point you're not using insulin even necessarily as a as a growth modulator you're using it to, to, to just to maintain the effects of, of high blood sugar yeah. 
you're taking it because no. you can't eat carbohydrates anymore without without needing yeah. insulin because your body is is isn't pumping any insulin through your bloodstream. It isn't sucking you up, but yeah, and so I think you know as a as a general rule, the the what's causing all the benefit, you know, growth hormone, IGF one, and insulin. What's causing the growth is the IGF one. That's the, I mean that's the key. That's what you right. want. That's the that's the that's the deal breaker. And so you know, so I say, why not just take IGF one? Well, the problem with that is, uh, in my experience, it's hard to find good, solid, legitimate IGF one, especially at a price that pe- that people could, could typically afford. It's right. it's easy to find IGF one, whether or not you know, it's easy to find a white powder that, that someone <laughs> says is IGF one. It's harder to know that it is you know legitimate, high quality IGF one. Right. But it's much easier to get growth hormone that way, and right. so. So, so I think growth hormone is kind of the basic first first approach. You're, you're guaranteed to get growth benefits. A growth hormone isn't something where, like Anadrol, you take it and then, and you're going to gain thirty pounds in six weeks. It's one of those things where if you take it at a, at a decent dose, are you going to notice anything in six weeks? Maybe not. Probably some form of you'll be rounder. But if you take take it consistently for five years, you're going to be dramatic. You're going to have a dramatically different physique in five years than you right. were if you didn't take it. It's one of those kind of long term things. And then uh, I mean. Insulin, the, the, the big the issue with insulin is everyone you know, argues whether it's anabolic or something. It's the most anabolic thing. A lot of people say it's not. And it kind of comes down to just semantics or technicality. What insulin does is, the, I mean, the primary thing insulin, I use insulin for is to increase glycogen storage. I like right. to use it in, I like to use it in times when we're doing a hypercaloric diet. So we're eating more calories than we're burning, but we're specifically trying to make most of those calories come from from carbohydrates. So we know right. if we eat, you know, 200 calories more than we burn, we're going to store those 200 calories. Right. Well, if I'm somewhat glycogen depleted and I'm using insulin, I can pretty much guarantee those 200 calories are going to be stored as glycogen rather than stored as fat. Right. If so you're only doing it in the anabolic window, though. I want to clear. Okay. Yeah. So we're talking three units, six units in your anabolic window. Post and then you insulin resistant over time. Yeah, I, I, I use the... I hate to give protocols out uh, to where anyone can jump on it. The way I use it is uh, I typically do it multiple times in a day, one day a week. You know, some really, really large bodybuilders more frequently, maybe two or three days a week. But I use it. I use it typically for glycogen storage. Sorry. Go ahead, Justin. Okay. I use it more for glycogen storage rather than uh, than to, to try to trigger a, a, a growth response. I mean, you, you get, you know, it increases amino acid uptake at the muscle. So it's not technically anabolic. It's not synthesizing protein directly or, you know, synthesizing new muscle. But what it is doing is increasing the rate of amino acid uptake at the cell, which then if there's a stimulus for protein, uh, so, you know, like an anabolic window, if there's a stimulus for for protein synthesis, you're going to have an increased uptake of amino acids to at that at that cell where 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 it could happen. So okay. it's kind of a semantic argument whether or not it's anabolic or not. I think it technically isn't because it's not creating any anabolism. But when any anabolism is is present, that insulin's going to potentiate it basically. Right. It's it's going to have an amplifying effect on on whatever anabolic response you're already having at that point in time. Yeah, yeah, but I'm I'm really I, as the years go by, I've become less and less of a high of a, a fan, I guess, of insulin. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, so personally, I think. Go ahead. Do you think the post-workout carbs to get the natural insulin response is necessary for the liver to make the IGF-1 from the growth hormone, or do you think the IGF-1s can going to be produced with or without insulin and carbohydrates? This is where. Uh, and this, I, I'm, I'm probably actually going to, I'm going to, I hate stating opinions <laughs> because uh, you know, I've read, it's hard to get really true, solid information on this. My, uh, and I'm going to defer to your, your background on this actually, because I'm interested to hear your input on this. My, my real gut belief and gut feeling is if the growth hormone you're taking is real, it's going to produce the effects uh, almost re- Almost regardless, to where you don't have to be as as precise and uh, and and kind of micromanaging with, with your diet, and so and this just comes from uh, this comes from a lot of my a lot of my views that 
I, I kind of have my science views and my experience working with clients views. And okay. my experience working with clients views has, has shown me that even in low calorie diets, even when uh, even when dieting, even in cases where we should technically be hypocaloric and you know and losing body mass, uh, and, we, and we are I guess losing body mass, but in in the in the cases where people who say you take someone who hasn't, and I'm thinking of one professional bodybuilder in particular, someone who is not using growth hormone in the off season, they move to 10 to 15 IUs of growth hormone pre contest per day in a low carb environment and, and dramatically increase their muscle size. Right. And so in my, in my opinion is that there's got, there, there has to be this IGF-1 conversion going on at a rate high enough. Uh, maybe it's amplified when, when everything's done. But it seems to be enough. And, it, and if you see, notice the numbers I'm giving, I'm giving 10 to 15 IUs of growth hormone where that's a, you know, a sky high amount. Yeah, it's a lot. And that you're, rate, you're taking so much in that even if you're getting a shitty conversion rate to IGF-1, you're still getting a, 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 lot. a buttload of IGF-1. Right, right. And I've heard that anything beyond four units, from what I've heard, doesn't double the IGF-1. That typically, with four units of blue top, Chinese, grade, GH, you might get a 200 mm-hmm. one If you're using 8, 12, 16, there's no additional IGF-1. But perhaps there's a third agent that's being involved to amplify this conversion that I'm unaware of in some athletes. Well, I will, uh, you know, and I can't find, that's an awesome point, I can't find anything on this. And, uh, mm-hmm. and but that's that's what my experience has been, and I don't have I don't have an honest explanation, and I hate them even when I talk to clients about it because I always try to explain the reasoning behind it. Behind it, but uh, there does seem to be some kind of additional benefit, at least short term. Now I say it short term definitely, and I because the opposite starts to happen when I, I, I always say you have about a ten year window of high do, high dose growth hormone use, and if you look at some of the largest bodybuilders. And, and you know, and you start thinking of terms like Columboism. But if you look at a large bodybuilder, you notice when they appear to have probably started blasting growth growth hormone, pushing things hard, and when their body started to fall apart. And you have about a ten year window. And if you think, if you look at Ronnie Coleman from 1996 to 2006, it's you know, pure size, pure size, pure size, and then the wheels really start falling off of the yep. ten year bar. You look at Jay Cutler from 2001 to 2011. You know, it's things rapidly start start declining, and, mm-hmm. uh, and then you look at maybe uh, uh, Marcus Rule or uh, uh, King Kamali. And you look at these guys, and you kind of start tracking it down. And there's like this ten year. It's almost like a ten year magic mark where you know what ends up happening is that these individuals start to get insulin And if you're taking ten IUs of growth one a day, you're going to have insulin resistance. You will be a diabetic eventually, and it, and it happens pretty quickly. You start seeing that. Uh, faster blood sugar starts climbing, and it, you know you see A1C levels climbing, and so it's not something I recommend uh, long term. But of course, Does that makes sense. Matter what you recommend long term, bodybuilders are going to do what they want to do. Right. So what I'm is that you've noticed anecdotally from professional experience what others like to call bro science. <laughs> you're, you're, bro science. You're using anecdotal, what do you call it, meta study, if you will is that after 10 years of excessive GH use, one gives themselves a type four diabetes, let's call it. Yeah, yeah. Now they need to use round the clock insulin like a normal diabetic, but like a diabetic, they're not gonna burn fat super great. So by the time they make it to the stage, they look softer than they had before they gave themselves diabetes. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and I think if you, if you can run through it, you start, if you start just picking certain bodybuilders where, and I'm talking where there's a clear definite uh, size thing. Someone who's, you know, maybe on the amateur scene or something, and then they have kind of that breakout year where they dramatically change, and you, know, you look at them, and you, and you know they did something different. And if you start following that for, for about 10 years, and you start seeing these, you know, the, the kind of the plumboism, you know, that the, to use that term, the, those kind of signs, you know, the widening of the waist, the, uh, the kind of the thing where the abs, and Phil Heath is starting to get it now. And actually, yep. if you look at Phil Heath, uh, what are we coming up, uh, you know, you're looking from 2007 to 2017. You know, it's he's 10 years. That, right. He's at that 10 yep. year mark. He's starting to get that line where if you look where his upper uh, upper obliques uh, meet with his abs, there's kind of these weird, there's a space developing and and, and uh, kind of tendon, tendons looking, you know, the, the abdominals start to distend. Uh, and then the next thing is kind of the, the, the quad sweep starts to go away. And uh, Phil hasn't had the arm part at all, but kind of the arm start 
it's almost like a, a nerve compression type thing where there's so much, it's almost like a compartment syndrome that you through their whole spine where right. the nerves start getting compressed and the triceps, the triceps start atrophying or their biceps start atrophying. And I, I, I actually just, had something similar like that. So I think you actually hit the nail on the head. Whereas the lack of blood flow results in lack of nervous stimulation to the distal extremities. And so you do get limb. And then the visceral fat, as the insulin sensitivity goes up, the greater proportion of fat distributed in the off-season would be visceral, yeah, and it's yeah. hard to pull it off with diabetes, so their abdomen would be having internal pressure, pushing their abs out, giving them that turtle look. Right. Yep, yep. Yep. It's good stuff, guys. Um, let's talk, Justin, let's talk about the carb cycling now. Let's talk about how you set up carb cycling and, and how it's evolved for you since you started doing it to where you are now. Um, just, just a basic carb cycle what, what, and then the difference between men and, fe- and women because there is a big difference between men and women and the way you have to cycle carbs in, oh, yeah. in my experience. You know, I'll, I'll kind of try to touch in depth on that at the end. But yeah, the, the, the basic approach is that uh, you know, people hear carb cycling and they go, I'm a, I just set them on a diet and one day they do 50 grams of carbs and the next day they do 100 and the next day they do 200. I do it, I do it totally different. Basically, my general approach is they're – on days you're tra- I, I take your basic basal metabolic rate, and so I'm taking someone who's done their diligence in the off season. They're not. They don't need seventy. They don't have seventy pounds of fat to lose. We can take an approach where we can take a 500 calorie daily deficit calorie deficit, which is roughly uh, half a pound of fat a week. Uh, yeah, some or no, that's a pound of fat a week. So roughly 3,500 calorie yep. deficit per week just from diet. You know, then mm-hmm. if we need to add cardio, we can put another 500 calorie a day deficit in to put them at two pounds of fat a week. I take that and, and try to set their their days off of training around that calorie mark, mark roughly. Okay. And then, okay. uh, and then what I do is that on the days they are training, I try to take what a, a rough estimate of how many calories they're going to be training, burning while weight training, and increase the calorie intake on those days with specifically with carbohydrates around the workout primarily. So that would be the medium carb day. So the low carb day is the lowest day in carbohydrates. The medium carb day is most of the days they're training, where the highest, uh, in the, the most, the highest carb meals are around their workout. And then mm-hmm. since we're in a complete calorie deficit all week, we're going to be using energy from the body. You know, anytime we, we're pulling basically 500 calories from the body every day. Now, the first place the body's going to want to pull is muscle glycogen. It's going to want to use those carbs. It's an easy energy source. So that's going to get, get depleted. Some level of that's going to also come from fat. We want, well, hopefully, all of it comes from fat. If right. You know, it to work that perfectly. But, but we know we're getting glycogen depleted. And so eventually you'll get to the point where you're so low on glycogen that the body, the body just, uh, it, it's more likely to break down muscle tissue, you know. And actually, when you think about it, when, when you're eating protein, we, we always think protein's going towards muscle. It's Most not. the protein we eat gets used as a carbohydrate anyway. Yep. We, we're just not converting a pound of protein a day to new muscle, or we'd be gaining a pound a day of muscle. Right. So, so you know, we get we get this glycogen depleted state. We don't have enough carbohydrates. We have protein, which can be used, but that's a piss poor. You know, it's got to go through gluconeogenesis. It's not a really good energy source to, to, to use as a carbohydrate. So the body starts becoming more apt to breaking down muscle tissue for energy. So before that happens, we we do a hypercaloric day. So one day a week, typically is actually a day where we're eating more calories than we burn, which sounds crazy when you're dieting because you're trying to lose weight. So why are we why are we eating more calories knowing we're, we're going to store store calories? But because on that day we, we do lower protein, very, very low fat, as low fat as we can get basically, uh, and we do really, really high carbohydrate intake. And so those excess calories do get stored in the body, but because we're storing those calories in the form of carbohydrates in a glycogen depleted state and probably using insulin also, we're more likely to store those calories as, as glycogen, which then gives us a hypercaloric day, which kind of gives it, you know, a little metabolic boost or maybe it doesn't boost metabolism, but it, it certainly should help, help help minimize any slowing of the metabolism right. from, the, from the low calorie rest of the days. And uh, and then if, and if you run the math mathematically, if you take someone like a, a, you take a light heavyweight or heavyweight bodybuilder and say maybe he can store 800 grams of glycogen in his body. Right. Uh, and so, say he's over the course of the week, he becomes 500 grams glycogen depleted, uh, and and so, and we also know that his basal metabolic rate with when we're doing a you know moderate protein, very low carbohydrate intake, maybe he can he can eat three or four hundred grams of carbohydrates and just burn those off by his natural metabolism. 
So if we if we assume he's got 500 grams of glycogen to store and he's burning through 300 grams of glycogen just in his normal or carbohydrates in his normal metabolism, that gives us 800 grams of carbs we can eat on that day in a perfect world where all the excess carbohydrates get stored as glycogen. It gives us 800 grams of carbohydrates we can eat on that day without storing a single drop of fat. And you think, right. you know, what, what kind of me, uh, metabolism boost can you get? What kind of training, you know, training energy benefit? And, and how much better are you going to be able to fuel your training the rest of the week on the low days? If you have one day a week where you can eat 800 grams of carbohydrates without, without storing fat. And so that's the, that's the general approach. Uh, and now, now to move to, and I'll try to stick with the number, numbers also. Now to move to females, why is so much harm for females? It's, it's strictly a numbers game. I mean, there's roughly, you know, rough estimate, there's 3,500 calories in a, in, a, in a pound of fat. Well, you take a large male bodybuilder, he might, burn, especially like we mentioned Luke Sando earlier, or no, Dominic Trevlini is a perfect example because his metabolism is insane. Yeah. You get Dominic Tre- Trevlini as a light heavyweight bodybuilder, he, he can eat 4,500 calories a day without training and not, and that, that's his basal metabolic rate is probably that or higher. <laughs> So on training days, he can put, take 5,000 calories in. And so let's right. say we drop we drop 1,000 calories a day for him. He's still eating 4,000 calories a day, and he's losing it, it, uh, two pounds of fat a week, weight, you know, calorie-wise, just from the calorie deficit. And he's still eating 4,000 calories a right. day. Well, so that's a 1,000 calorie deficit, and he's still eating a shit ton of food. Now take a female. You take a, a bikini, a figure competitor, who probably has a basal metabolic rate somewhere around 1,500, 1,600, maybe 1,800 calories. Right. Let's just say 1,600 calories. When you try to do a 1,000 calorie deficit with her, she's only at 600 calories you a day. Can't do it. Yeah, she's starving. Yes. Right. And, and, you know, that's, and that's, unfortunately, that's what a lot of prep coaches do, is that's <laughs> what they just shove at them. So yes. You don't have the room to maneuver. And then conversely, also, you don't have the glycogen stored. Someone, you know, a, a hundred and... 12 pound uh, bikini, bikini competitor isn't going to be storing. She does She can't store 800 grams of glycogen. No. Maybe she can store two or 300. At the very so most, yeah. You also don't have the same room to take those really high calorie days to kind of keep metabolism the metabolism high. So you're stuck with you can't go really hypocaloric without starving them, and you can't go really hypercaloric at, at any time without making them fat. So you don't have the 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 room to kind of go these big swings one way or the other without. Or, I mean, I guess you could do the big swings, but what you're going to do is dramatically screw up their metabolism, which yes. is so unfortunately what happens with a lot yes. of them. Yes. The other thing to mention is if someone is eating 3,500 calories, their leptin levels are going to be high, so their ghrelin levels are going to be low, so they're not going to be hungry. Exactly. And they could still be a 1,000 calorie deficit. If you take a girl who's eating, you gotta, you're assuming a perfect world where the 1,600 basal metabolic rate bikini girl comes to you out of a vacuum. Usually you get them after some piece of shit who is feeding them 800 calories. Right. So now they've got a fucked up metabolism and you have to build them back up to right. the point where they're at 1600 so they can have full leptin at even 1200. And their whole cultural environment is women sabotaging them, say, oh, you could have a little bit of this, you could have a little right. bit of that. Right. So that if you try to give them an extra 200 carbs, someone talks them into having a, what do you call it, a Cinnabon rather than having so a, like a three. I, just don't do that. <laughs> That's actually, I don't mean to cut you off, but that is a that is dead on perfect thing that the culture, especially the workplace culture with females, that's the best I've ever heard of put because that's that's a big thing that you don't run into as much with males. You, you go with a male and he's at the workforce and he's eating his, you know, his steak and rice or whatever. Guys are curious, but that's that's it. Mm-hmm. You go with a female and have them eat their food and every other female in the office who's who's unhappy with her weight or unhappy with her appearance makes it their their job to try to get this girl <laughs> off off her. Trying feet. to sabotage what she's doing. Yeah. Yeah. If, you're, if you're a lower dress size than me, I fucking hate you and I'm going to ruin your life. Exactly. And that's basically what they're feeling, but they're like, I'm just looking out for you. I care about you. And they're so full of shit. It's like, <laughs> it's, 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 it's with women for too long, I just get worked up about how they treat each other like that. Right. Because guys are just like, dude, you look diesel. I need to eat what you eat. Rock on, dude. Yeah. Girl, fucking bitch. You know, and that's pretty much the extent of it. <laughs> Yeah. So with with a female, then Justin, uh, how how much you know typically? I mean, do you do you use a percentage based as as far as how how high you'll take them and how low you'll take them on on their uh, cycle? Uh, it's really it's really just I, I have a big question here. I have people fill out, and I find out what right. they've done previously. Okay. Uh, and then the 
other problem is, is you know, it's 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 hard to it's hard to be really. You know, when you, you I use macronutrients, so I give a food list and I tell them to choose from this food list and in this meal get this X amount of protein. Well, really, you know, people try to do say they're eating 321 grams of protein a day or 314.2 grams, but they don't realize that it's really you, you can only be so precise. You know, just like humans, everyone's got different body fat percentages. Every piece of chicken you eat has a different level of fat and then a different amount of protein, a different, you know, density of the muscle tissue. Some of them have been injected with uh, with uh, broth, you know, so everyone's a different level of right. dryness, a different level of fullness, and every time you make oatmeal, a, a different amount of water soaks into each grade of oatmeal, every time you make rice, and so when, you, when you're measuring, you you really can only do about five gram, gram chunks, you know, you could I could tell you to eat 21 grams of protein in a meal, but you, you're not, you're going to get somewhere between, you know, 16 and 26 grams using the exact same measurement every time. Right. So that's another issue. When you take these females down and you only have them eating 15 or 20 grams of protein a day or a meal. Huge main point. Yeah, you know, you can, there's, the, that, the, the variation almost becomes as much as they're actually eating in every meal. So it, that's another thing that's hard. So you really have to be fine-tuned their diet and, and kind of, uh, I, I, not say, I don't want to say limit food choices, but make sure they stick to the same food choices and, at the same time each day. So even more right. They have a smaller food list than you would than you would typically give than a, a, a male heavyweight bodybuilder. Well, it's a pr- probably a similar food list. I just say uh, with a male, you know, he, he's got kind of complete freedom where if he wants to switch between chicken and turkey and 96.4 ground beef in any meal, he can do that freely. With a female, if she, you know, if she decides to go with... Uh, Chicken t- tenderloin in a meal, maybe switch between chicken tenderloin and chicken breast, but don't, don't, never switch to salmon in that meal without telling me. Right. You know, things like that are going to be too, too dramatic of a swing for them. Right. And it's like those minor changes show up on their body. And I think they look at themselves way more because you hear about it more. It's yeah. like, I don't, I could tr- like coach a dude for 12 weeks. He doesn't bring up the food a single time. Would you talk about the weights or something else? Whereas a lot of girls, they'll be messaging you six or seven times a day about everything they're eating. And it's like, I don't like this brand of chicken because it makes me look fat, but this brand of chicken doesn't. So you have to say like, well, what's the sodium content? And it's like, yeah, yeah. Something, you don't you have to micromanage the food, just like Justin's saying, with guys as much or be as on point. Right. And it's not just their fault. It's not just emotional that because they're a smaller person with a much more fragile metabolism that these tiny food portions to us, the slightest variation, like whether it's cooked or uncooked, well, that's a 25% variance right yeah. there. And that if you don't specify that correctly, with then it could be a huge difference. They could be having 600 calories, not 1,100 calories, right. if they all cook their food. Even more, what if you take a, a red meat, you know, if you, you have a meat, maybe a steak or a round steak or flank steak, women tend to cook their steak. You know, most men just go, you know, the manly thing to want your steak is as rare as possible. Well, women, right. they burn the hell out of it. So the, so they're drying it out even more. And so if you if you tell them to measure something uh, pre-cooked, you know, raw, and they mishear you and they measure it after they've cooked it, and you tell them to have three ounces of flank steak in a meal or two, two and a half ounces of flank steak in a meal, and they cook flank steak and burn the hell out of it, and they're measuring two and a <laughs> half ounces of, of, you know, deep, you know, burn to hell flank steak, that could have been five ounces when it was, right. when it was raw. Right. Right. Yeah, I just had an instance actually today where we had one one of my uh, clients that had switched between 99.1 turkey and 93.7 uh, turkey because that's the only thing that was available at the grocery store. And I had to make adjustments today based on, on fat content and stuff and, and pull fat out of another meal and stuff. So it, with the women, I know it's 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 a little bit more of a balancing act than it is for, for a man. So that is uh, definitely an issue there. Uh, Justin, what about... Once we get going down, like say, let's say like an off season, is that is that the same approach you use in the off season for their um, carb cycle? You use that in the off season, or is that just something you typically yeah, use? Yeah, you know, it just it's not as dramatic. It's really more it's more of a two way swing. Basically, you have your you have your base days where you know, and and this is another thing I don't do. I really I try to keep guys lean, and I don't do dramatic calorie swings. You know, you have guys that right. are. You know, like I say, I try to try to do things as analytic as possible. I mean, the, the human body is isn't you know it's not a linear function where you can say you know mx plus b and change b and you're guaranteed a result. You you know there are a lot of variables, but I try to be as as numerically uh, 
consistent with the variables as possible. And so when you're dieting, like I said, we look for that 500 calorie a day deficit. Well, if you're if you're gaining size, you, you, people want to gain fat size quicker than they than they they can. Right. And you you really have to look at it. And you say if you're gaining a half a you know, guys want to have 40 pounds in one, you know, one 12 week, you know, crazy yeah, it's story. not going to happen. But it doesn't work that way. If you can, if you can gain a half a pound a week, every week, you know, oh, that's 25 pounds a year. That's 75 pounds in three years. You know, if, if, if anyone gains 75 pounds of stage weight in three years, you know, good for them. They're, you know, they're, they're going to be on the Olympic stage. You right. Know, because they're, they're a friggin' monster. Right. That's only a half a pound a week, you know. You know, you could be extending off season to 365 days. Right. So the, the size gains are really pretty low. And if you do a half a pound a week, you're looking at, you know, somewhere around like, it's really only uh, 120 calories a day of actual protein synthesis. Right. Something, something like that. So, so in a perfect world, you take your exact metabolism at 120 calories uh, of the precise macronutrients where you're, you're creating – uh, every one of those 120 calories goes to synthesize new muscle. That then, then all you need is 120 calories more. More, so you don't need uh, these crazy high calorie uh, programs. The problem is you can never be that precise. Right. So you need to go a little higher. So I look somewhere probably around 300 calories a day. Okay. Uh, above what their you know their true basal metabolic rate is. So so the basic calorie swing is if we're in a 500 calorie deficit while dieting and three to 400 calorie surplus in the off season, we're looking at somewhere between 800 and a thousand calorie a day difference total. So it's, it, it does add up to be a pretty big difference, but that's, that's right. kind of what I'm doing. I'm taking, taking the, the calories we removed when we were dieting, adding those back in and then just adding a small amount higher. And so, and my, my macronutrient ratios change a little bit too. I still, still, you know, cycle carbohydrates, but it's much less of a cyc- cyclic thing. It's more of a, we have our basic days where we have uh, mod, you know, pretty moderate protein, moderate to high protein, and we have higher carbohydrates with with the highest density of carbohydrates around the workout, and then we spread healthy fats around because you know, fats I think have some benefit in in, in energy levels and uh, in feelings of well being, like being and even possibly, uh, it's, and then right. somewhere between depending on a person's metabolism, one to three times or even four times a week, you still have a very high carbohydrate. Day, but on those very high, high carbohydrate days in the off season, it's really more of a high calorie day. It's not quite as precise. quite as uh, pre- precisely, you know, shooting the carbohydrates really high. We're just taking the calories higher. Right. So basically, you pretty much quoted exactly how I look at everything, even down to the <laughs> part where, from when I read between the lines, you don't feel extra fat is extra anabolic. Is no, that correct? No. no. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, there's certainly, I don't want to misstate my, what I'm saying. I say there's, I think fat is good, and I don't, I think uh, extremely low fat is, isn't great. But I don't, I, yeah, I mean, I think a, a good amount of healthy fat throughout the day is, is all you need. Like, I usually get whatever fat I use. It comes from the egg yolks, it, it one yolk a day, whatever beef or turkey or chicken is being used, and maybe anywhere from 200 to 500 extra calories of what people call healthy fats like coconut oil or olive oil. That's about exactly what, exactly what I'm doing. I'm I'm adding maybe five to 10 grams of healthy fats in a meal, which would be, you know, three to 500 calories a day from it. Yeah, exactly. Right. Cool. Cool. So now we, let's say we get into contest prep and you're, and you're doing your, uh, you're doing your carb cycle and stuff. When is it typically where you decide to start pulling back and adding more low days, or you do you not do that typically unless you absolutely have to? Well, I will if I have to, but typically what I do is I'll, I'll adjust the days. Right. I, rather, I'll, keep, I'll, I'll still keep higher calories when they're training, the, the on tra- days they're training, the calories will just decrease. And kind of, I, I do kind of some systematic things, some general approaches I do is uh, I'll do, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start with an intro shake. We'll, we'll keep an intra workout shake as long as we can. Uh, but when we get deep in the diet and the person's really hungry and they're craving for, they want to chew every calorie they can. An easy way to cut 200 calories out of a diet is to pull pull those intra workout uh, calories. Right. And some people, I know, uh, 
if I, who, who's, if I talk, John Meadows doesn't do that. And I'm sure he would probably argue that he, he doesn't like that approach. My, my feeling at that point is we're deep enough in the diet, close enough to the show where we're, we're not building new muscle anymore. We're, right. that's, we're, we're hoping to hold on to every, every, as much muscle as we can. Uh, but we're, we're not building new muscle. So really forcing anabolism around the workout becomes less important. And if I can take 200 calories out of the diet without the, health, without the person eating a single less morsel of food, that's a, that's a great move to do. Right. Um, and the other thing I'll do is I'll start pulling calories, carbohydrate calories, early in the day, which a lot of people I, I don't, maybe don't do. But most people aren't that hungry first thing in the morning. I mean, when you're right. dieting, you're always hungry. But one of the easiest times, as far as hunger level is concerned, is usually in, early in the morning. The harder times are late in the day. So rather than just start pulling calories from later in the day where they're already struggling and they're already mm-hmm. prone to have their slip ups, if I can pull calories from meal one, where they they mm-hmm. they most people make their food but without even really thinking about it, and go to work or whatever and do their thing, and by the time meal two comes around, they've hardly even realized they you know started the day. If I can right. pull calories from there, that's another easy place. Uh, right. And then the next thing, another thing I'll do is when we get really really, really deep in the diet, is I'll change from the carbohydrate sources from complex carb sources, uh, maybe not in every meal, but in, in certain meals and, and, the, and increasing the number of meals that we do this as we go, change those carbohydrate sources from rice, potatoes, oatmeal, things like that, to, to vegetable sources. You know, you, you're you eating, uh, if you're eating 25 grams of carbohydrates in a meal, that's a half a cup of white rice, where, you know, you can have almost a full cup of, uh, of corn, or you could have uh, almost over three cups of green beans, you know. And so we can we can cut calories that way without decreasing the food volume, and then that that lends us to make even further changes later on, where we can decrease calories without changing their food volume by by switching from a higher carbohydrate vegetable source like corn to a lower calorie source like like broccoli or or spinach. So say we have them eating a you know a cup of you know say in meal two they've been eating a cup of white rice. Well, at, at one point at some point we switch it to a, a cup of corn. So we've dropped calories already by, uh, even though they haven't decreased their food, their volume at all, but we've cut some calories. Right. And then we switch that to a cup of green beans. Boom, their, their food volume is still the same, same high. They're eating the same, same number of spoonfuls in, a, in that meal, but now the calories have dropped. Then later on, we can drop that to broccoli or cauliflower. And again, we drop even more calories without changing their food volume. Right. So I'm already uh, rather than adding more, more low days in. So you're basically taking away the actual glycemic carbohydrates and then just basically replacing them with fibrous carbohydrates and stuff so they still get calories and with, once once it's uh, um, but they don't have the actual uh, carbohydrate and the calorie source is not, not as much but the, the actual food volume itself that they're having to ingest and digest is exactly the same amount. Yeah, so that you know, so it's easy. I mean, you still at the end of the day when you're low and when you're calorie deficient, your body's going to send signals that you're hungry. But if you can take a little bit of the edge off by at least not eating less food on top of that, it does, I think it helps helps mentally uh, with, with the diet. Right, right. In regards to the intra-workout shake you mentioned earlier, I don't know if you recall what we talked about at that seminar, but we were talking about the different type of glucose disposal agents uh-huh. in contrast to insulin mimickers. So in order to make my intra-drink fit that parameter like you said like it's a waste of 200 calories when you're a couple weeks out to have a a sugary intra-workout drink so i would what i used was a lot of glycerol and like cinnamon and sea salt and um vandal sulfate isoleucine different um, glucose disposal agents and the sea salt to get that type of intra-workout pump but keep the carb value low so that people would be able to keep it in yeah and then i just add them I just add sugar to it, you know, yeah. like in the off season, I add 15 to 30 grams of sugar to my mid workout for that purpose. Yeah. It's, a, it's also about the, the sea salt. That's a, a great, great additional thing you could do as your intra workout when the pumps start going away is just introduce some sodium in yep. the, in the and, and what I'll actually do is I'll have them use a uh, baking soda. Uh, oh. Yeah, it just it adds a little carbonation. It makes it almost feel like you're drinking a pop, you know, but it has the sodium in it. <laughs> and uh, if people think you're a magician. You make that little change, you add a little sodium in there into your workout. You can pull carbs out, add the sodium in, and their pumps are actually even better. And, they, and, you know, they think you pulled some kind of magic out of their hat, but, you know. It's, it's funny you brought up a baking soda because I wanted to 
baking soda and vinegar to make it taste like and look like Guinness because it's battle mead. Oh, but yeah. we figured people would be puking up like foam and people <laughs> think they're all rabid. Like, oh, that dude's got rabies. And it would just be too intense. So that's why they won't have it. <laughs> Yeah, they think you're just pulling some sort of magic, and it's really just the sodium pulling water into the into the muscle cells. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> they're more than likely they're not drinking enough water, and they're not getting enough sodium throughout the day anyway. Yeah, well, that, that's another thing. I, another thing with dieting is I, I wish uh, the whole internet culture thing. It seems to be better now, but I remember years ago I used to read people cutting sodium out six weeks before. Oh so my god! I remember reading one guy saying. He stopped brushing his teeth because he didn't want the sodium fluoride. And uh, it's it always drove me crazy that uh, why? Because no, no top guy, no top coach or competitor does that. But no. somehow this idea gets passed around the internet that these bodybuilders are, you know, stop salting the food and cut sodium out. You know, we, uh, who knows how long before contest? <laughs> you know, and I, I don't know why that gets passed on, but it drives me crazy. Yeah, because honestly, I mean, I I put sea salt on every single meal, and I have most of my clients do the same thing: put sea salt on at least a little bit of sea salt on every meal throughout the day, just just for that simple fact that you want to make sure that they stay hydrated and their muscle function is is the way it should be. I mean, electrolytes are important. I mean, yeah. electrolytes are as important as minerals and vitamins, and sea salt has all the minerals that aquatic life forms had, and we crawled out of the sea unless you're a um, very religious, so <laughs> it makes no sense to why wouldn't you create plasma volume with the ingredients of plasma, water, and sea salt? Right. That's a, that's a good way of putting it. You got any other questions? So I have one more question. So, right. beef protein, carnivore, other brands. I always figured it was tendons and hooves boiled down. Yeah. Listen, it's just alanine and glycine chains. <laughs> you know, do you have a, a do you have like an opinion about that? So about beef protein uh, powders or? Yeah, the, the commercial beef protein powders is an alternative to the dairy whey, or the unstable, hard to get genus protein, which is on paper the best. It yeah. tastes like best, but. <laughs> With um with the beef protein, if it's cheaper and it comes from steak, how the fuck is it cheaper than dairy? It doesn't make any it, sense to me. Well, exactly because it's the shitty protein. It's lips and asses and collagen. It's not. It's because they're right. not. It's yeah. It's no. It's a, a a if you could get a high quality beef protein source where you could see the amino acid profile and prove that it was the same amino acid profile as 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 a steak. Yeah, great. Go for it. But I don't think you're gonna find it. And I think even. I think Dante might have even done that maybe what, a year or so ago where he posted some of the, he actually had some lab assays done on various products. And you can see that that's basically what the, what the beef protein was, was, was just garbage. Yeah. Well, I remember once I did buy some beef protein from him before I knew it was his, when I just knew it was true nutrition, my girlfriend like made it up and we made like co- mocha cocoa flavor and stuff. It tasted so horrible compared to, <laughs> all the other brands, I'm like, this has got to be from real beef. That's because this it's, company is no joke. Yeah. And it was pretty expensive, too. It was like oh. for 400 grams, it was the price of someone else's that was like two or three pounds. So well, in other words, see, yeah, when you see people selling two pounds of it for or, or five pounds for $19 or some of the crazy stuff you'll see, it's, it's you know, you know what I always say is uh, if, if when uh Women have a problem with this because when, women don't get what they pay for always. Because you women, they'll go to Kohl's or whatever, and they they run seventy percent clearance items and discounts, and and they can get great deals on stuff. Men's products don't work that way. You buy a no. tool, you get what you pay for. If you buy a more expensive tool, it's probably a better tool. If you right. buy a cheap ass tool, it's a cheap ass tool. And uh, and so I try to tell people that really the supplement industry is the same way because there is no way to cut costs, cut costs beyond cheapening the material right and so if you get, you get what you pay for you know which which sucks because i mean it really sucks because the, a lot of these smaller companies uh you know you know like your like your stuff where you're putting out good stuff and and i had a problem with this when i when i was doing my own stuff in my company is because i refused to put shit out you know garbage right. out there i wanted good stuff but then you 
your prices are, are high, higher where right. people, people look at your prices and they don't know the difference. And they know this other company back then, it was like muscle type or something, you know, this other company that had all these badass advertisements and stuff. Uh, where they they have these great, awesome advertisements, flashy ads with, with way cheap, cheaper pricing. And um, especially with things, you used to drive me crazy with like amino acids where people would say, you know, well, your, your, your anatrope is real, it's real gritty. And I say, yeah, because there's 10 grams of L-leucine for percentage. <laughs> L-leucine is a big ass amino acid. It's gritty. Right. And they would say, well, I tried this other amino acid and it was really, you know, real smooth. It's because there's nothing so, in it. So, I went through yeah. that the first time, <laughs> Justin, and what I found was, one, have someone who's either overweight or a girl do your flavoring. That makes it taste so good. No one complains because you and me, like Dorian Yates' philosophy, is like it tastes like shit, so it works. That was the old slogan: "Does it taste like shit, so you know it works?" Yeah, no one bought that. And then the other thing is, I knew that no one's gonna buy shit if it costs more. So I said, I'm gonna match everyone's price, and I'm gonna do free shipping, and we just won't make any fucking money. Like we'll have a different job. We'll make money elsewhere. Just make a product to run all those fucking criminals under the ground. Yeah. In 10 years, when people trust our shit, we'll make enough at a time we will make a small margin and be able right. to make more products. But it's like, like you said, to get up off the ground and make a quality product and make enough of a margin to be able to do your own advertising, research and development, and all the other elements that go into it behind the scenes. Because people look at the price per unit and they're like, why would I pay this much for it when it costs you this much to make it? I'm like, because there's other parts of the pie graph, like storage and manufacturing and paying the lawyers and paying yeah. designers yep. that no one realizes goes into that type of business. They think it's just you in your basement with like making gear and next to the gear is where you're making their products. And it's like, no. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, where, where are you shipping? Who's, who's producing the bottles? Who's doing your labels? You want good labels? You right. You're a graphic designer. They don't work cheap, y'all. Nope. There's no. It's all a lot goes into that shit. And so if you want to make it good, you can put in the ingredients. Because everybody else, if you look at their pre-workouts, it's like six fucking grams of serving. I'm like... How did you fit enough creatine, enough arginine, enough beta alanine just to make the basic with just six grams? That's impossible. Exactly. Let alone got three grams of hard drug stimulants that make people shake and make them puke their guts out <laughs> and make them not eat for three hours after they work. <laughs> I was like, you got like three grams of meth and then three grams for everything else you're supposed to be. <laughs> Well, that's why they, because they don't, well, and they do the, pro, 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 the proprietary blend. They don't have to say they, they list, list the right. proprietary blend and it's, you know, uh, and the 17 different ingredients in it. One of them's creatine, one of them's, you know. And, and you, you know, don't know how much it really is. Actually, yeah. yeah. Well, I didn't have to do that this time because before I did it without the proprietary blend and someone who spells the name Jim wrong took my formula and then mass marketed oh, it. So oh, I, man, that sucks. Yeah, and so this time, I what do you call it? It put the, all the ingredients on the website, but in order to get it patented so no one can copy it, you do have to use a prop blend because I think it's bullshit. But that is like a thing that I didn't realize is if you prop blend it, it's patented. Right. So I didn't. Even, I didn't think about that either. And then, uh, well, you want cost there, then you got another cost for patenting it too. That's yep. Okay. Right, but you avoid the patent cost by doing the prop blend. Then. Okay. A blending of it when the FDA approves that the actual blend is what you say it is with the back, with the, like the email that goes out with the sample you send them. Uh -huh. Now the patent is built into that. Oh, nice. Okay. It's a one-time price per prop blending, and then you have the patent built into that. Supplements 101 with Todd Lee. Yeah. Okay, I'm wearing stuff. <laughs> <laughs> this is my third attempt at this shit. Right. I had to open the company to make sure it was done my way. Right. I couldn't have like, you know, like normally they're like, oh, you can own 10%, but you get to pick all the formulas. Bullshit. You know, like <laughs> they take your formulas, they <laughs> tell you whatever they want you to hear, but in the end, you don't have any decision making. You've either. got a couple of, uh, you got a couple of supplement lines out there, Todd, that don't have your name on them. It's your stuff. Right, exactly. Exactly. And that's, a lot of people are, we call it making money with shit I came up with over the years. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a, that sucks. Yeah. But uh, at least now I've got my own. And that's the important part because it's exactly right. how I want it. All right.
right, guys. Well, uh, <clears throat> Justin, you got anything else you want to talk about? Uh, you know what? I kind of actually did want to talk a little about adrenal fatigue. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. That's kind of been a, a complaint I have because I think people go about it wrong. And, and, and I'm going to, like I said earlier, I'll defer to Todd on this because I don't have the medical background he doesn't. So this is my my understanding of neurotransmitters and, 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 and things that I would see. Well, first of all, uh, I haven't, you know, I haven't looked recently, but as of when I was last doing anything in the medical field, there was no official diagnosis of adrenal fatigue. There was Addison's disease, which is, you know, adrenal insufficiency, which is a totally different thing than people, people than what people think they get when they take too many stimulants. And, and, and so what, what, whenever I hear adrenal fatigue, what I'm really viewing it as, as, no, you, you've just become addicted to stimulants. You're not, there's no right. adrenal fatigue. <clears throat> right. I, you know, so if you're out in the woods and a, and a grizzly bear jumps out from behind a tree, I can guarantee, guarantee you're going to feel a burst of adrenaline. <laughs> you know, the adrenals are still, still, still functioning. What, what, what happened is, is that you're taking all these stimulants. And so you take a, you take a shit, shit ton of caffeine and, and, and caffeine works on adenosine, but it also works on uh, norepinephrine and, and acetylcholine and serotonin. And so what happens is these these chemicals go, ner the nerve send a, a, a signal, it reaches a synapse, and these chemicals get released into the synaptic cleft. Well, when, when you take these stimulants, it releases more chemicals into the cleft. Well, the body's response is it doesn't want all those chemicals out there, so it gets better at reuptaking the, the, the chemicals so they don't sit out there as long, and so it sucks them back in so they can't exert their effect. And so pretty soon you have to take more to have the same effect and more to have the same effect. Well, when you're working with something like caffeine that's, you know, not a pharmaceutical level product, there just isn't enough. You can't you can't increase the dose to, to the point where your body is basically better at overpowering the, the reuptake as, as, than the caffeine is at, at pumping the stuff out. I mean, you never hear a meth addict talk about adrenal fatigue because right. they can just, they're so potent they can just smoke more meth and, get, and still be wired as shit. Right. And so what ends up happening is you... Uh, you, you, you take this caffeine and your body just becomes so good at, re at sucking these neurotransmitters back up that you can't, you don't get the same effect out of it. It's not that there's, a, 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 the adrenal glands aren't fatigued. You, you, like I said, you know, go, if you think, if you think that you're actually, you know, fatigued adrenally, go jump out of a plane and see if your heart starts racing. You know, <laughs> that fight or flight response is still going to be strong as shit. Right. You've just become addicted to stimulants. You know, it's just, right. it's like saying, uh, you know, it's, it's like saying that, an alcoholic that somehow becomes alcohol fatigued. No, you know, it just it takes more alcohol to get drunk because the body's... But, and so that's my big complaint about it is that... Right. Uh, uh, and kind of the, the problem with treating it is, you know, most of the methods of treating it is you do something like take L-tyrosine. Well, the, the, the thought behind that is L-tyrosine is a precursor for the adrenaline hormones. But your problem isn't a lack of hormones you're, you're, or the neurotransmitters. Your problem is that you've had too much of them... <laughs> pumped out of the synapse for so long that your body is just better at sucking them back up. Right. And so, you know, taking something to increase the output even more is just kind of, yeah, you're going to feel better, but it's not because you're fixing the problem. It's because it's got such a dramatic drop from going from, from taking the strong stimulus to taking a precursor for the strong stimulus. The other element to this negative feedback loop you're talking about, aside from the um, presynaptic cleft synapses reuptake is the actual receiving neurotransmitters going to have a deregulation of the receptors too so again to increase the amount of um tyrosine to make more epinephrine or norepinephrine isn't going to upregulate the amount of receiving receptors so you can keep throwing locks at at, you can keep throwing keys at this wall, but if the locks are disappearing from the wall, there's only so many keys that are going to turn per right, day of time. Right. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, this is. I'm glad. Well, I feel like this is something that needs to be talked about because I, I see this all the time, and I I see it pop up on Facebook more and more recently, and people talking about adrenal fatigue after their workout and all this bro science that gets pumped out, and you know, and and I try not to get out in the internet arguments because it's frustrating because. It doesn't matter if what you're saying is true or not. And, you know, most of the people don't have the background. They don't understand. And so whoever yells the loudest or, you know, types the most in all caps is the right. one who they think wins the argument. So I haven't really jumped on this much, but it, it has been kind of bugging me for whatever reason lately. And so I'm, I'm glad to hear that Todd feels the yeah. same way a little bit. Well, if you overdose on Hyde, 
Oh you my know, god! Like, oh, I took three scoops of hide, yeah. and it's all it takes to for me to work. And then two weeks later, they're like, "Oh, dude, I can't get a pump, and I can't work out anymore." And I was like, "Take more hide." They're like, "No, I, I don't have any money." I was like, "Like, like you're being serious." And then they're like, "No, what I mean is like, <laughs> why don't you phase off the caffeine for three weeks mm-hmm. and try working out again, and never go over the little line where it says you will die of a heart attack during the alcohol <laughs> Don't go over that, and then maybe you won't blow your shit out." And then, you know, like when you talk to them at their level and you're like, you're going to blow your shit out. They're like, dude, really? Thanks. But if you're like, you're going to downregulate your receptors on your post <laughs> And they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? Right. He's all trying to sound smart and shit. Right. Fuck him. Yeah. Instead of taking three scoops of Hyde, why don't you just take one? And then, and, and, and then in like four weeks, just stop taking it for a couple of weeks. And then you can go ahead and start using it again. And then I'm like, you know what? Just use mine because I'm smarter than those fuckers. Right, and I'll be like, okay. And then that works now. I mean, it right. didn't used to work, but it works now. Because there's not 600 <laughs> milligrams of caffeine per scoop. Oh, yeah, that's a problem with some of those pre workouts and stuff. Is that you know a little bit of caffeine uh, before you train if you need the energy and stuff is great. I mean, but I mean, a cup of coffee works just fucking fine for me. I don't, I don't need to sit there and, and ingest three, four, five hundred milligrams of caffeine and every stimulant known to man along with it. Because, I mean, what you're just wired like wired as shit. And then if you train at night, you're not, you're not sleeping. There's no way. Let me the problem is it's because it's a cheap, easy way to pr- produce a product <clears throat> that has an immediate, you know, right, immediate mental impact. And so, right, you, you, you could, you could, you know. Spend all this time researching and put together a perfect product, you know, it, where you're looking for cell volumization, driving nutrients in the muscle, doing all this stuff, where if someone else can add, you know, 600 milligrams of caffeine and a, and a bunch of teacrine, and, and, and boom, someone takes it, and their eyes, you know, pull back in their head, and they think, <laughs> oh, this stuff's awesome. Right. You know, it's, it's, just, it's, you know, it's a cheap, cheap, gritty, dirty way of making making your product seem like it works, when all it is is, a, you know, it's a dirty stimulant. Right. What I found was most of the negative symptoms, the, the subjective assessments, the jitters, the shakiness, the I can't eat after work come from the synthetic adrenal stimulants, things like that are like meth with one oh. carbon, or cocaine, yeah, or one yeah. carbon. and that caffeine, all the studies show that you do get an increase in endurance and strength and muscular output and stuff, and that the, the formula is supposed to be six milligrams per kilogram is the limit on what someone can benefit from. Anything beyond that is expensive. So with um, my pre-workouts, I put caffeine. I put a little bit of Yohimbi, so you can liberate the fat from where you want it liberated. Uh-huh. I didn't use any of the other stimulants. But like you said, I put a bunch of fancy pants crap to upregulate GH, upregulate IGF-1, drive nutrients into the cell, gave them taurine, because I know the little fuckers are going to be on clenbuterol, whether you tell them to or not. <laughs> So I try to put all that stuff in and people say like, as long as you know, like I don't shake, I have a clear focus and I'm able to eat afterwards. So I don't think the caffeine's really the culprit. I think it's the other stimulants they put in with the caffeine. Right. Like oh, the, no, I, you know, don't, don't worry. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a caffeine fan myself. So <laughs> I just, I'm just picking that as the easy one, to, easy one to discuss. Right. Yeah. What's that? DMA. That, that, that type, what's the stuff in hide? But it's, it was crack. DMAA. It's crack. They put everything in They put everything in height. Yeah. Was it the problem with that? I, I, I've taken that. I, it doesn't even make me want to work out. I want to go party or something. <laughs> it, you, know, really, <laughs> it, it, you know, I think a lot of us use use weight training as kind of our ADD medication. And, right. Uh, and, you know, you get too strong with the stimulants. You're basically taking, you know, taking Adderall or, <laughs> or something. Right. I, for me, anyways, I no longer want to work out. I want to go do something different. It, it, you know, it kind of zaps my focus. Caffeine's really bad. Caffeine's really the only stimulant that 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 makes me actually want to go train. Every, it seems like every other thing I've tried uh, has the opposite effect. I get stimulated, but I don't. It, it's to do other things. It's not to go train. Right. I want to hurt people. Yeah. <laughs> when I'm a pre workout, and someone like looks at my dumbbells or like looks at my bench, I want to hurt them. I don't even. If I miss a lift, I get so angry. Whereas if it's just a normal pre-workout with all the other shit that we take, I'm able to be really focused. So I think like the hard drugs push that they put in most of these pre-workouts really pushes me over their edge into like some psychotic territorialism. 
<laughs> All right. Anything else, guys? No, I think I'm good. Yeah, I'm good too on it. Todd, you got anything else? I have like one other question. I think. All right. Um. Do, 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 do. You know what? It really was answered with what we talked about earlier. It basically had to do with like how you felt about G8 secretagogues being suppressed by the presence of IGF-1. But if you're saying that the chances of getting real IGF-1 are so low, then it's kind of irrelevant. So, yeah, I mean, I, I just hate to say, I just feel like I don't have, uh, I mean, the, 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 the study show what the studies say about IGF-1, I feel like my anecdotal evidence of people working with it isn't, I, I just don't trust that, that what people have is, 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 I see so many different results, basic different levels of results, and I don't know whether whether to say it's, you know, but I can't trust that the person had true IGF-1. If I could trust they had that, then I could say these results were because of this, those results were because of that, and I just don't feel like I can say that. Right. So your anecdotal evidence doesn't match the clinical studies. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, which which to me makes me want makes me believe that it, it, people aren't getting the real thing. Right. Cool stuff. All right. All right, man. It's well, been a true honor, dude, getting to talk to you about. This. No, I just yeah. want to say one thing. I am a. It's been an honor because we've been talking for an hour and a half, and you have you ate the entire time. I was <laughs> <laughs> like. This is my new hero. <laughs> Dude never stops I never eating. Stop eating. <laughs> I never stop eating. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 Justin, anytime you want to come on here, um, and it doesn't even make a difference what we're, what we're talking about, anytime you want to come on, you're more than welcome. Just let me know. Uh, right, we would yeah, love well, to have yeah, you on again. Do anything I can for low, you know, for Michigan stuff, so. Anytime you want me on, just let me know. Awesome, awesome. So again, it's uh, MuscleMentor.net. It's nine ninety nine a month for the sub uh, subscription to that. There is a bunch of free stuff on there, so everybody should go take a look at it at least and and see uh, some of the stuff that that Justin's got on there. Because, uh, like I said, I, I went through it, and some of that stuff is just really, really valuable information that you can learn a lot from. Uh, and then uh, your company, your your prep company, is Troponin Nutrition. And you can find that at TroponaNutrition.com. He's got uh, some of his clients up on there. There's some uh, there's some article stuff on there too, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. I, I had a uh, membership membership section there. Okay. Uh, and so, and I'm I'm not sure where I'm gonna do with it because I, I kind of stopped updating that and focus on muscle mentor. So, okay. I, I might make it you know available to everyone, but there are still some members of it, and so I want to make sure that I. You know, kind of cancel their payments and everything before I make it free to everyone else. But that will right. probably be coming in the in, in the future. Okay, definitely. And uh, so, Todd, uh, thanks for coming on. Kerry couldn't be with us, obviously. So hopefully, uh, we get him back on next week because he would he was actually really bummed about not being able to uh, be able to be on. He was contemplating if he could be able to call in later but uh, he didn't know he's like there's no end in sight of me actually getting out of here so i feel bad for him but uh well, it's all engineers are all assholes. yeah they are all assholes so for todd lee and for justin harris i'm keith faber saying thank you for uh, listening and go to soundcloud.com and download the app so you can listen to this on your phone and not on your desktop because I feel like a lot of people are doing that. They're listening to another desktop because they can't figure out the fucking app thing when they when they <laughs> click on the link. It's it's ridiculous. I'm like, dude, it's not that hard. Shit up. It's not that fucking hard. No, you put it in water and drink it. So anyway, for Todd, for Justin, I'm Keith Fabry saying thank you for listening. Keep grinding. We'll talk to you guys later.